Say from Mr. Sager? From Mr. Sager. For $105? Yes. That is lunch bill. That's his lunch. Motion to approve. How many? Second. Any second of discussion? All those in favor? Motion carried. Laura, did we get that letter for her? New business, case dash three dash SPR, case continued from May 2nd, 2017. Valley Point LLC C slash O White Mountain Survey to develop 2400 Route 16 tax map 7, lot 11, intends to raise all existing man made features and redevelop to include a 5,000 square feet convenience store with 25 parking spaces. Drive up window for coffee and prepackaged food, a dedicated service and unloading area. <clears throat> four, two, four, says four, four, two, two, pump disper dispersion islands, a fuel delivery station, drinking well water, 600 gallon per day, effluent disposal system, and driveways onto Route 16 and 41, etc. Letter received 424, 2017 by Maryland and in Delicado. Delicado. Delicado with concerns for Route 16 and 41 development. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a motion to not to not accept this project as regional impact. Uh, second that. Oh, yeah. Main second. Discussion. Yes, sir. Um, it's certainly within the authority of the planning board not to accept this as having regional impact, <coughs> but uh, that kind of defies logic because this project appears to meet two of the six criteria for defining regional impact. 
that is proximity to a neighboring town, and I believe Tamworth is about 400 feet away, and a shared aquifer or surface water body. In this case, there is a shared aquifer. So uh, there's more reason to accept this as having a regional impact than not. In fact, I don't understand an argument. I'd like to hear an argument for not defining this as having regional impact. Any other discussion? We'll move for more. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion is carried. Outstanding uh, permits yet to be received, but uh, so these plans could change. This is what you've been looking at since right. January. Yeah, the layout has not changed. Notes have changed, been enhanced. Right. Permits have been initiated. Uh, permitting has been initiated. Okay. Yes, well, uh, Chairman, I, I'd like to ask in particular if uh, Mark could summarize the changes that he listed for us at the May 2nd meeting in particular. Well, that's what he's going to do. Right. Is that correct, Mark? That is correct. Thank you. I'm here with your pleasure. It's your, it's your show. No. All right. So I will uh, update the board as I did May 2nd right. at that public hearing. Right. And I will then follow up with uh, the material that you asked for at that public hearing May 2nd. And just for the record, I believe that was a public hearing, and the applicant did not offer any information that wasn't asked for, and that was the proper thing. We did the it was a public thing. meeting, not a public hearing. Very good. So, we're now back to the public hearing. Okay. To which as far as this board is concerned, a meeting or a hearing, the public always has the right mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. We've never denied anybody the right to speak, so mm -hmm. let that young lady in behind your back. It's in the upper lock. Hello. Welcome. I don't believe that walk would be fire code. Locked or unlocked? Unlocked. Okay. Uh, 
Um, okay. So when I was here uh, in May, uh, on May 2nd, uh, the board asked if I had any updates, and I gave the board updates, all that I had at that time. Uh, I know Damon was here. His notes are probably better than, than any of ours, but I'm going to rely on my memory, Damon. Uh, thank you for that. You want that? No, I don't need that. Right. I, I've, I've got some sketched out notes from memory. Well, I mean, this is what exactly you got. Fantastic. Let's see how close I can uh, right. how close I can come. Again, this is the layout that has uh, been uh, dated December 12, 2016, revised uh, the 18th of April. This is the same layout that you have all been reviewing uh, since I first met with you on the 3rd of January. <coughs> there have been some changes. The changes are only the result of planning board input, fire department input, and input from uh, state regulatory departments and agencies. Among those, let's see, uh, DOT, the traffic impact study is in fact underway as of today. The, I, don't, I think that this might have been discussed in April, but the four-way intersection here, that is still on DOT's plan, but the realigning of 41 is no longer on that plan. The fuel delivery station has been shifted slightly to the west. Once we found out where Don Enrich's existing well is, uh, we were able to move the fuel film station, right here, fuel delivery station, uh, to the west. And that uh, location meets uh, both the town and uh, DES well setback requirements. Met with uh, the cemetery trustees oh, about a month ago and have determined a location for an access drive so that the uh, trustees will be able to uh, gain easier access for their care of the Civil War Cemetery, or the cemetery that de uh, dates back to the Civil War. There will be four 10,000 gallon underground storage tanks located here. They will be uh, under underground beneath a concrete pad, but they will be uh, direct burial. They will be double wall direct burial. They will not be inside of a concrete vault, for instance. The on-site uh, well, that has moved slightly at the request of DES Water Supply. They uh, prefer, or require actually, that the well be located not less than 50 feet from uh, road rights of way, so we've moved the well slightly to this location. And as sometimes is the case, that now is under review by DES Oil Remediation and Compliance Bureau. Because by placing it where water supply would like it, or requires it to be, it's a few feet closer to the proposed uh, fuel facility than was the existing well from the existing fuel uh, uh, facility. So that's under review at this time. One or the other will need to give a wafer. It doesn't matter to me which. It'll be a uh, drilled deep bedrock well. It'll be going through the aquifer. Let's see, uh, the plan, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, mixing here between April 18th and May 2nd because the discussion kind of carried on. Oil separator, <coughs> excuse me, oil water separator. I have uh, opted to increase the size of that tank from uh, the previously proposed 2,500 gallon to 3,100 gallons. As, a, as stated, uh, I'm sorry? 3,100. It's a two, two compartment tank. I have details here for you. 
to be the second sheet in this packet. As asked for, on May 2nd, the detail the oil water separator is on sheet two of these two sheets. I have one for the file one. Second sheet. That's a precast uh, structure. First compartment, 2,693 gallons. The second compartment, 464 gallons. Uh, these are referred to as the before tank and the aft tank. Before tank being the larger of the two. As shown in the detail, there's a, a separating wall. It has a vent cast in it up top and then down uh, 12 inches off the floor of the tank to allow for sediment deposit. There's a six inch tall by 60 inch slot. You can see the, the bold black arrows. You can see your inlet to the left. It goes through the slot at the bottom of the tank, then outlets to the right. That's the direction the storm water will travel. Fuel having a lighter specific gravity than water. If, if any fuel finds its way to this separator, it will float on the surface. That's the theory of a, a fuel or oil water separator. So that the aft tank, in theory, would never see uh, fuel. This is similar to what uh, you reviewed and approved at the Holiday Pines uh, station, uh, but this is something I've worked with the tank manufacturer to come up with specifically for the site. Mark, I've got a massive big, big fill, spill to actually make the other tank. I, I've got a question for you, Mark. What provisions have been made to prevent, as we know concrete is porous, what provisions have been made to um, prevent any migration of fluids through the concrete? Really? I mean, I, I, I don't... Gasoline, water, they will migrate through concrete. Over a long yes, time. they will. Yes, they will. Um, what provisions have been made? It's just on paper right now. Okay. It, have you, any provisions it, been you, discussed? If you would like to make some uh, suggestions, I'd gladly accept them and then uh, present them. Well, I just wondered if the tank is sealed. And it's sealed at... <coughs> At his joint, as shown in the detail. But not the exterior surface? No, in fact, if I was going to seal this, I would seal the interior. With, the interior, with Zypex or something like that? Exactly like that. Or the foundation seal. I'm not aware of that ever having been done, but we can certainly uh, spec it. Okay. Uh, if, if the board so chooses. I might do it on my own, but. Yeah, I made the comment it would take a pretty big spill to reach the the, the swallow at the side of the tank. In fact, I did some math just a few minutes ago to determine that. A couple thousand plus gallons, I believe. Well, it would be uh, 1,975 gallons, in fact. Oh, that's close. Nothing in my head. And, it, it, yes, I'm sorry. I'm no. <laughs> okay. Um, Along that same line, and following up on May 2nd uh, discussion, uh, I have looked into some sort of an alarm that could detect an otherwise undetectable large spill. And what at this time proposing is a, a specific gravity discrimination sensor. It's a float. As we know, water and oil have different specific gravities. The float is um, sized and sensed to float on the top of water. So let's say a couple hundred gallons, otherwise undetected, finds its way into this oil and water separator. The water level would lower, and that sensor would recognize that. 
and key an alarm uh, that will be located inside the building. The alarm would have a distinctly different sound than the low fuel or uh, tank leak sensors. Uh, Mark, we discussed at the May 2nd meeting what the response would be if there were a significant spill, that is a spill uh, that DES, DES rules would require reporting to DES, which found its way into the oil water separator. But recognizing that some components of gasoline are water soluble, uh, we discussed whether uh, procedures should require pumping the entire tank out in response to a spill, significant spill, to find its way into the oil water separator. Yes. I'm going to take the lead there, Bro Connie. Okay. Um, as also represented at the May 2nd meeting, Sheet 1 is now a compilation of everything that your code enforcement officer will need to refer to at any point during uh, construction all the way through for years to come. Here's your consolidated list of notes, Connie, that you thought would be a good idea. Right here. And with <coughs> that, we have groundwater uh, protection plan notes, fuel delivery and dispensing safety notes. Within those note blocks, uh, if determined that the, or have suggested a maintenance schedule for the oil and water uh, separator, it would be complete. <coughs> drained completely annually or after a defined significant spill, whichever would come more frequent or more frequently. Okay. Thank you. Mark. Yes. Could I be taking drain uh, storm water too? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yep. That's a common technique. Yeah, but I mean Yep. There are two of them. You're yeah, go ahead. All this is going to be, if you have a heavy storm like we had the other day, it's going to be full. Um, actually, the oil separator will be full to its invert, as you can see by the detail, right. at all times. <coughs> at all times. At all times. You want the oil on top. Correct. And we, we want to be sure that that sensor has an opportunity to, we, we don't want it to drain out, Connie, between rain events because the um, discrimination sensor will go off. False alarm. Right. Okay. And if you ignore too many of them, we'll be in trouble. I'm not sure what Holiday Pines has done. I'm not here to re-review that. Uh, but as I mentioned, um, I think on May 2nd, they have two. And the reason that they have two 2,500 gallon oil water separators is because they have two points of discharge. The stormwater discharges in two different locations. But they're quite larger than you are. Uh, yes, and we have. Uh, sure. First time <laughs> uh, in that same vein, we have made. Uh, a change to the stormwater collection and conveyance system. Everything goes through this oil and water separator prior to it discharging into uh, a series of dry wells. Each of these, uh, excuse me, both of these catch basins are what are called deep sump catch basins, uh, which are extra depth sumps. And Connie, I'm, I, in an effort to conserve uh, paper, I have made reduced scale sets of, of this, and I have a full size for you to have on file for the uh, public. And on sheet, Turn to sheet six, upper left hand corner. Six. 
some catch basin detail. And you can see that's just your typical catch basin, but it's got a deeper sump, and it has a hood on the outlet, sometimes called a snout. And that uh, is providing the same outlet protection as the oil and water separator. If you look back at the oil and water separator detail, same hooded outlet. So if any gasoline should find its way into the catch basins, into the closed drainage system, even before that, uh, the stormwater reaches the oil and water separator, the, oil, the fuel will be intercepted at the deep sump catch basins. Okay, it was suggested that I make contact with uh, Chief Huddleston, I have. I've spoken with uh, uh, Chief directly. He didn't feel that it was necessary for us to meet face to face. He had received a plan set earlier on in the process. Um, I have forwarded him the updated plan set, spoke with him yesterday, and as of, as of this moment, he hasn't offered up any uh, comments or any additional em embellishment to the uh, to the safety notes. And I think, Connie, that was your specific uh, concern that, uh, that uh, Chief Huddleston have an opportunity to add to that. His schedule isn't anything at all like ours. I, I don't call him. Uh, Monday's the only day. He, that's, that was yesterday, yeah. But otherwise, he's out on call and he's somewhere. I, I don't want to sell him. Oh, you want him to DOT. <laughs> um, you drove a truck, you know where you want. Okay. Let's see. It was suggested that if there's a catastrophe and by some fate or some reason that fuel does find its way to the oil and water separator and there's a downpour at the same time like we had Saturday into Sunday, we put a gate valve coming out of the oil water separator gave that some thought, and I think if you do, you, you might recognize there could be, or there likely will be, unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea, but if that rain continues, if we're collecting the entire site to that point, then what will happen? Eventually, the oil and water separator will overflow, and what's on the surface of that fluid? Oh, it's the gasoline that you're trying to trap in there. Now, uh, the oil separator, oil water separator, can capture 19, oh, 1,975 gallons prior to it even reaching the aft tank of the separator. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good sized spill. I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, I, I, I have no knowledge of spills, how often they occur. What they're at, what the average spill volume is. So I'm thinking that close to 2,000 gallons. Somebody's going to notice it. And either shut off the fuel delivery truck valve or pick up the hose over at the dispensing station and put it back in its place. So, um, yeah, I've, I've given the idea some thought of the gate valve. Um, but at this time, I'm, I'm not recommending it for that reason. And speaking of shutoffs, the fuel storage tanks, underground fuel storage tanks, when a delivery truck comes and clamps on his, I think it's a four inch diameter pipe, uh, drains from the fuel truck by gravity into the tanks. Uh, the tanks have integral auto shutoffs. Uh, Dennis Boyce Fair is with me this evening and if you have any questions in uh, having anything at all to do with fuel storage, dispensing, delivering, 
I wasn't able to answer two weeks ago. I brought Dennis with me tonight. When you get through, Dennis, stand up. And Fantastic. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Then uh, why don't I um, quickly go through the other enhancements that we've made to the plan set as a result of input from new folks, Fire Chief, DDS. Uh, perhaps the, the most significant one, again, is uh, redesigning the drainage, the closed drainage system, <coughs> to capture all of the site with little to no excavation in this area where the, the previous gasoline station was. It's tanks, it's uh, pumps. Wait a minute. Excuse me? Not going to any excavation. We're, we're limiting the excavation. There's no more deep excavation. No more deep excavation. Correct. We had proposed uh, dry wells in this vicinity. Not doing that now. We are uh, proposing to run the, the state's drainage through a culvert beneath this driveway on 41 and have the state's drainage continue down to the state's closed drainage system rather than taking it on to the site. And the dry wells would be off on the left there? Too. Yes, the three dry wells in the groundwater recharge area here. <coughs> that has to be approved by the DOT? Yes, and it's designed to their standards. <coughs> so that's just another permit that you have to get? The driveway permits, one for Route 41 and one for Route 16. And that ties into um, the DOT permitting process, again, the traffic impact study is underway as of this morning. Jarrell Palmer is doing the, the impact study with input from DES, uh, excuse me, DOT. Um, the on-ground count was done a couple of Saturdays ago, and uh, with a seasonal adjustment factor, which was discussed with and approved by DOT. In other words, the, let's say the, the 1st of May, the traffic isn't the same as it is the 1st of July, so we need to adjust that upward. Um, quite honestly, there's not a whole heck of a lot else that has, has changed. Grading drainage plan, no changes other than the, the layout. You raised the canopy to 15 uh, Yes, okay. You got me there. <laughs> we did. Um, landscape plan, identical to what you were looking at in January. There have been some relocation and reconfiguration of the landscaping areas here at the uh, groundwater recharge area. Details have been um, updated. We, we've added additional curbing. Uh, we've got some sloped curbing uh, at the entrance off of Route 41. And that ties into uh, the, the drainage changes that we made. That's new. That curbing there, that curbing there is new. DOT doesn't like um, curbing out where they will hit it with their wing plows, so we, we recognize that and we've, we've held it back. Um, so that's something new is curbing, sloped granite curbing. And that is detailed on sheet six. Um, the low, uh, light pole base detail, we've added the height of the uh, light. Um, they'll be 16 feet tall. Nighttime friendly lighting, LED uh, fixtures. And then we have sheet seven, which is the, the last sheet in the construction uh, plan set, and these are, are more details. We've added quite a few more um, erosion sediment control details. Due to the size of the ground that would be impacted by, by the project, this plan will require a uh, stormwater pollution prevention plan. We've added that requirement in the erosion sediment control requirements and guidelines and specified that it must be prepared by a certified professional erosion sediment control and a professional engineer 
licensed to practice in the state of New Hampshire. And oh, not the big six. Yes. You have conduit trench. Mm -hmm. You're saying you use a scheduled body. But under a driveway, you have to have scheduled lady. Mm -hmm. Okay. We do know that where beneath pavement, uh, it's concrete encased. But whatever the utility. Uh, it is. It, I, the 80 arm encasement. That's fine. You do that. Well, I just no. I mean, I didn't see it encased. That have to be 80 encased, does it, Steve? No. You were just concrete. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, well it's in concrete and thought. I didn't see the concrete. Yep. Uh, that's an enhancement to the notes, in fact. Um, it reads, um, okay, it's sand or fine backfill, blah, 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 where trench crosses over or under storm drain, water or sewer pipe, or under paved areas, the material should be cast in place, class A concrete, 10 feet both sides of the crossing. <coughs> if you'd like, I can uh, have Dennis uh, uh, answer any of your fuming questions. Wow. And again, Dennis Boyce Fair of DB Tank Design, and I also have reduced scale plan sets of what Dennis has just submitted to DES today. <coughs> I have a question about, uh, we discussed this the last time. Okay. Uh, probably the one thing you can't prepare for is human error. We discussed this with someone in the tank. They subscribe to the feed and it comes off the truck. That still doesn't tell me uh, what's to prevent a driver walking away and getting what he's doing. I have some money that you didn't like that over from the tank. I've seen that done twice. Yeah. And you don't want that happening here. No, no, I do not. So what kind of an alarm do you have to warn the driver that the tank is becoming close to that? Okay, I will let Dennis, Dennis Boyce Fair from uh, his company, DB Tank Design, handle that sort of question if you don't mind. There is no alarm, but each tank has a mechanical shutoff valve in the fill pipe and it has a float on it that comes up and it slows down the flow into the tank at 92 percent of capacity so that that tells the driver that things are slowing down it's time to turn the valve off he has three percent while the tank will still allow more fuel to go in that fully shuts off at 95 percent so that gives him three percent of tank capacity to drain his hoses get all that drift out so that when he takes it apart he doesn't have a a spill at that point. The driver's reading is off the truck. He's not reading, but he can sense how fastly it's flowing. You hear the rush of, of fuel coming through the hoses. So he senses the change in sound. It's slowed down. You'll shut the valve off. I and then it's 10, and then it's 5% beyond that. They can wander off and not pay attention to it. If it gets to 95%, it stops. Okay. That's what I'm It stops. Full stop. Something that's going to stop. 92 is warning, or well, slow down, 95 is full and, stop. And it still leaves enough room for draining the rest of the country. He's going to have more trouble. It's not in his interest to do to get to there because now he's got more of an issue. He has to drain that back to the truck, I guess, because yeah. it won't take anymore. Huh. See, the slowdown will allow fuel to still go into the tank slowly so he can drain those hoses. So and he knows he's smart enough not to drain it under the ground. He's got a problem to wrestle with if he's let it go to full. So I guess my question is, Probably well, DOT is going to require that the U.S. is going to require that you have some plan in place if that happens. They what are you going to do they with don't. that? You've got 100 gallons, 50 gallons of fuel oil in that long. And now you can't put it in the tank. Where's it going with it? You have to put it into another tank, perhaps. I don't know how he solves that problem. He no. doesn't spill it on the ground, I'm sure. <laughs> well, if a thousand tank, thousand gallon tank is empty, you fill it to 95 percent that leaves you basically with but he has no way of filling it the rest of the time right but i'm saying it leaves you with 50 gallons 
and there's no way 50 gallons would be in a hose, right? No. Uh, it's no, actually, well, it's more like 500 gallons. But I believe what he's saying is that once the tank hits 95% oh, right, right. capacity, it will not allow any more fuel at all to go into it. Yeah. Correct. Okay. So well, the maybe hose through his piping, he can run another hose to a different tank. I don't know how he solved his problem. And it's his, he's got a problem. I don't know how he deals with it. He's not lining cars up. I mean, I'm sure that you know that hose is going, holds a, a fair amount of, of quantity, and he's not going to spill it on the ground. He, he won't be working on it. Oh, jail. I mean, that's not an accident. That's a, that's intentional. That's a bit all of other that's, that's jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah. Those spills you're talking about, or some of those are of the past. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Tanks used to use ball floats, uh, which are sort of after the fact. Similar concepts, but the tanks I guess were pressurized. The question I'm saying is, you know, I mean, what's it going to cost to put a fill up along in there? If the man's not. If the man's not here to sense that the shutoff is but shut off. going to be available to react to what's going on. I mean, this way, the driver could run. I've just, I've seen this happen. That's why this is a concern. I hear you. Uh, you have one for old. You have one for yeah. a sensor for outside, you know. But when you saw it, there wasn't in the tank. When you saw it happen, Dennis. Were these tanks designed to shut off automatically, or did they just overflow the tank all over the place? Just overflow the tank. Well, that can't happen. That's the point. It's right. already built into the tank. So I the only thing you've got to have, if the guy's going to really screw up, to have a hose full of gas. Look, we're trying to make this as safe as possible. I understand that. Okay? But, but you can't overflow the tank. I've given you an indication of what could happen. Now the question is, it's happened. He's got a truck driver there. He's already shown he's incompetent by letting it get this far. What does he do with 100, 200 gallons of oil in a line and no place to go with it? So what does I he don't do? think he can add that much in a line. But yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not familiar with all the truck driver procedures of where he gets into a problem. I'm not a trained deliverer. Uh, an alarm. I'm just looking for an alarm. I think there should be something in the tank. When it gets up to three quarters, have you ever designed a system that had such an alarm on it? So when it hit the there are high level alarms. When it hit the ninety five percent mark, an alarm goes off. Whatever you choose to put it in. Ninety. 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 You should because the system, the system will tell. The system will tell. Well, if he goes in and, and looks at that, or or the attendant will know how much is needed or have a, an approximation. The system in the store, the console, reads uh, volumes, inventory control. It's your alarm panel. It tells you if you have a leak in the sensor. Um, if your line leak, your line leak detector is, is triggered. Uh, any, most of the things you say by the interstitial, which is the sensor between the two walls of the tank, if, if you've got a problem there, basically you have a number of lights and, and, and readouts that will tell you what what sensor has gone off and what your problem is. We're in the is. realm of human error here, and human error often involves just not paying attention to what you're supposed to pay attention to. So it seems to me that Dennis's idea of an alarm that goes off by the 90% mark, it, it's going to wake somebody up who's not paying full attention to for whatever reason. It's cold, it's sick, he's distracted, he's talking to his girlfriend, whatever. That's doable. Thank you. I hope you do. Any other questions? <coughs> I have some samples if you're interested of the piping. I'm interested in seeing what that looks like. This, um, as we've talked about, month ago, um, <coughs> sort of a two and a half um, layers. This pipe right here is, is the primary pipe and secondary pipe. This, the outside, this blue color, it's peeled back here. That's just a scuff guard. That's just to protect the pipe itself. Inside the foil, there's another layer. And if you look at the end, it's sort of waffled in between. In the black, and there's a lighter colored blue, that's the inside, and that actually carries the fuel. So this pipe could be buried by itself, and, and that is double wall containment. That is coaxial pipe. This is coaxial, exactly. Um, this, this goes right into the, into the sump 
on the tank and as well as the dispenser sumps so that the two are opened. If, if the primary fails, fuel will come out the end, drop into the sump, trigger the sensor, <coughs> the alarm goes off. What kind of fitting is used to seal it? Is it like pressure there pressure? are There are flexible boots that go at the two sump ends. Um, part of that, on the inside of the sump, it, it seals around here. The other part of, of this, which is commonly done today, it's not required, but it's commonly done, but uh, this corrugated is piping is basically just to protect the pipe conditioning. It's kind of a rock guard today. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to 2005, other pipe systems would be a single wall pipe inside of this, and this was your secondary. Mm -hmm. Since ethanol uh, fuels came along, it would attack those products, and so that's where these came along, and people just started doing this as a convention, and this is simply to protect the outside of this pipe. What we're going to do in this project, which is, can still be done, the, uh, the outside of the boot, outside of the, of the tank sump, or the dispenser sump, okay, this would go to the wall, and the, the outside of the boot clamps onto here. Mm -hmm. We're going to pressurize this hose, pressure test it. Not pressurize it, but pressure test it. It's not required by the ES rule, rules right now because everything, this is compliant all by itself. So we're going to pressure test the outside here so you, so if, if somehow you get by through both layers of this pipe, this will still capture. Now long term, it will, it will decay, but on short term, it's going to capture your leak. What is long term? 20 to 10 years? Plastic, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, on the soil. 10 or how long contact time? It might be 10. I mean, it, there's some systems out there that they're still chasing uh, some systems that still have the older pipe in that was installed prior to ethanol fuel, mm -hmm. and those are starting to break down. Uh, so, yeah, it starts to break down. When does it fail? Who knows? 15 years. Uh, and the crash is approved by bar. This isn't exactly, uh, the sample I couldn't get was exactly, that black typically is not in there. This may be for some other purpose, but it looks pretty much like this without the black interior. Is that polyethylene? Yes, this is. If you like, pass these right, if you'd like to take a closer look. And the coaxial cable, was a coaxial pipe was made out of fiberglass? Nylon. Nylon. Yeah, there's a foil on the outside. I'm not quite sure what that's about. The hardware components of it. Uh, and this is actually as stiff as it looks. That this is flexible pipe. Longer lengths are flexible. Longer lengths are flexible. Right. Yeah. Seems pretty rigid at this length. Uh, and as was discussed in other meetings, uh, these systems have zero joints between the sumps. The only openings are inside a sump. The other thing that allows is if you have a problem that you can't pull this pipe through, the, the fuel pipe through this and replace it if need be uh, without tearing up the concrete. That's, yeah, that's really why it continues to put in sort of a, a small benefit uh, or small cost for a big benefit at the end if, if it should need to replace it. Do you know what the crush power is on that? Pardon me? Do you know what the crush factor is on that? No. Uh, the manufacturer requires you know certain burial depths so that it's protected. Uh, it's different. It's about a foot under concrete, 18 right, inches under asphalt or or uh, earth cover. And that's part of what my job is uh, as a designer is to make sure the manufacturer requirements have been met as well as meeting the DES rules uh, for minimum slope and all of that. All these pipes slope at an eighth of an inch per foot so that they it doesn't sit in a sag and fill up first. It, it flows and gets to a sump, so it gets to a sensor. And it's all covered by concrete. Concrete or asphalt. Well, it could yeah. be, it could be under the, soil, too. The, the, the paving here is, is uh, concrete. Eight For this site, well, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's concrete under the canopy. Yes, yes. And it's concrete over the tanks. Yes. And the rest That's is asphalt. Well, but it could be, could be a gravel lot, and it's still, uh, mm -hmm. it's still viable. Mm -hmm. Everybody want to see that? Yeah.
when Irving went and did their um, their expansion, they did triple air. And could I just ask you why you're doing double air? I know it's the minimum and it meets standards, but obviously Irving didn't pay more money in order to just just for the hell of it. They did it for a reason. I'm wondering why they did triple in this day and age, and you're not doing triple. That's, uh, that's, that's yeah. triple what? Triple lining for both the for either the tank or the piping. You, you're referring to they, the uh, triple uh, wall uh, piping that goes from the tanks to the dispensers. I think. Right. Thanks. Fiberglass. As I said earlier tonight, we're not here to rehear the Holiday Pines Irving Station <clears throat> and what decisions this board made then. We're here to discuss what decisions this board will make for this project. In answer to your question, though, I'll field that question. There was a uh, public drinking water well less than 300 feet from that facility, Dunkin' Donuts. DES required they go to the extra length because of that. So you don't think when you're on an aquifer, I mean, really, this isn't a question for you. It's really the question for the owners. And a, a concern we should be for OSPE residents and, and members of the aquifer that you're, you're building, um, you know, you're, you're building in this day and age, you're building right on top of an aquifer, and you can do what, what our Irving did, and you just decided not to. I understand when older buildings didn't do it because the, the technology probably wasn't there, but now it is there, but we're just simply um, doing the minimum possible standards as far as safety and environmental protection on top of an aquifer. I'm presuming there's a question in there somewhere, but I'm, I'm, I'm that's that's my question. I draw I'm, my water. My family draws our water out of the same aquifer. No. Yes. I'm I'm not. I'm sorry. At the May second meeting, I believe you told us that you've gone to the coaxial nylon tubing because the triple wall fiberglass comes only in set lengths, which would not correspond to your design here. Is that not? Uh, it wasn't in May. Uh, I, I, it was at some early. earlier point, but I think right. that, it was that explanation was offered that uh, the fiberglass, uh, that, yeah, the fiberglass uh, comes in specified lengths, which did not work for this design. Also, you uh, objected to the clamshell joints, which potentially could leak, I think you said, in the previous meeting. No, we didn't object to them. We just are uh, using a different type of piping. The well, I mean, that was what I understood to be the explanation for going with this right. double wall nylon as opposed to the triple wall right. fiberglass. Be because at every every joint presents um, a chance of leakage. You eliminate the joints, you've eliminated those chances of leakage. That uh, seems like we had that long discussion about triple wall. And that was one of the things I was leaning towards. And in your explanation, you told us because using the double wall, you have no joints that can leak. It's one constant point. And it made sense to me that if you eliminate joints, you eliminate risk of being spilled. So what's safer, or the Ir Irving, or is it, or is, or is this one safer? Ir Irving has what you're joints saying in its fiberglass. They're straight. So Bob, Bob. I'm sorry. Let me introduce answer, please. <laughs> In fact, as Dennis just pointed out, the coaxial pipe, the delivery pipe, <coughs> is two wall. That's going inside a four inch diameter sleeve. That's triple wall. It's not required, as uh, Dennis pointed out. It doesn't need to be leak tested to be sure that it's leak proof. This project is doing that. So what's, what's just to go back to my question, what's safer? What they did down there in the aquifer, or what we're doing up here um, on Route 41? They're both the it's same. Possible. They're both the same. DOT is the one, excuse me, DES is the one that told Irving this is what you're going to put in. Irving did not have a choice. But it's, it, it's to, so to answer my own question, then the answer is that's safer than what we're doing no. up here. No, no. Okay. Sure. It's, it's not, no. It's, it's, not it's apples and oranges. Yes. No. I'm just trying to get clarification. Well, I'm not trying to be arguing. based on no. DES requirements. Yeah, exactly. May I answer? We. Yes, yes please. Yes. please. Please. You're the expert. You're the expert. Yeah. 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 If you are drawing your water from your well, and you put a connection in it, you have a possibility of sucking air in that 
connection. These gentlemen are putting a continuous hose from the tanks to the pumps. There is no connection, which is safer. Okay. Still not sure I understand, but. There's another well, distinction. Go ahead, Dennis. The corrugated pipe is a third layer of protection. It is not a rated pipe, either. The pipes are rated, uh, UL rated, for today's fuels. Those corrugated pipes used to be the secondary containment until the ethanol fuels came along. And now they do break down. But it takes 15 years or more to break down. So and that's why it's, it's kind of two and a half, basically. We're, we're going to have the containment. If the, if the coaxial pipe failed, both layers failed, that corrugated pipe will hold fuel. Because we're going to pressure test it so that it can't hold fuel. Would you want to hold it for 15 years? No. But you're not going to. If the alarms will go off, you shut the thing down, you're going to replace all the pipe, you flush the gasoline out of that corrugated pipe, and it's still good to, to serve again. So they're equal in that respect. Uh, for 15 years. I, I'm not trying to be argumentative, but it seems to me it, this the aquifer is going to be here for a lot longer than 15 years. What, what I'm talking the here? third layer. The right, third so the layer, third layer, we layer have to doesn't. Fail two layers first. So basically, it doesn't exist. At some point, the, the third layer doesn't exist hey, anymore. Excuse me, please. Your third layer is not going to have fuel unless you have a leak. So it's good forever. Two leaks. Okay. You're going to have two leaks to get to the third layer. That, that you can leave fuel in your third layer for 15 years or went bad. That can't happen because they've got to dig it all up and replace it as soon as the alarm goes off. The, so, alarm, the yeah. alarm will go off when it passes the first, the, the, the most interior pipe. That's your primary. You get a leak through that pipe. If you take a look at it, you'll see the, the honeycombing between that layer and the next. Fuel will flow through that, get to a sump, hit a sensor, and the alarm goes off. That's what happens. There's no reason I'm that it good. should even go to the to the outer corrugated pipe because the alarm will go off and they're going to repair or replace the inner coaxial pipe. These DES would, would, would allow me to put that in the ground as is, okay. without the outer. So, so really I don't even have to pay attention to the corrugated part at all? It's usually just a rock, rock okay. pipe is what they call it, just to protect it from impact. Okay. Or to allow them to sleeve through without tearing up concrete. It's, a, it's installed as a convenience, typically, and it's not required that it be pressure tested for that reason, because the inner two layers are doing the work, and that's meeting the regulation. There is, Mr. Chairman, a regulatory distinction to be made between the Irving Station and this one, as I understand it. The Irving Station was within 500 feet of a public drinking well, so DES, as a result, required uh, the Irving Station to use the triple wall uh, fiberglass piping. Uh, here, the nearest public drinking well is <coughs> more than 500 feet, so that requirement apparently at DES does not kick in. So the improvements that you're seeing here over the initial plan are, as I understand it, uh, essentially voluntary. They're doing their best to make this as safe a, uh, a station as they can. Um, it's hard to see the distinction between the safety level afforded by triple wall fiberglass with its joints and the double wall with the extra cover on it, uh, piping with no joints. Uh, sounds to me about the same, but uh, I'm not an expert. All right, Dennis. And that was my next question, if I may ask one question very quickly, Dennis. The triple wall with the connections, um, in your opinion, safer, better? They're not known for failure, but each connection likely has to, the possibility. What's more likely to fail, a joint or a continuous pipe? And that's our logic here. Uh, contractors certainly enjoy putting this together more so than triple wall fiberglass, uh, but that's not part of your concern. I might add to, to answer some of your questions, this system has in the order of 28 leak sensors between tanks, sumps, um, in every which way. So uh, every every dispenser, there are two dispensers on each island. Each one has a has a sensor in it. Uh, there's a sump where the pump the pump head is located on each tank. Each one of those has a sensor. There's a sensor that 
monitors the space between the inner and the outer tank wall. Each one has one of those. Uh, they add up very quickly. Uh, in fact, we'll have additional, set, there'll be two in each dispenser because the dispensers, like the Irving site, are double wall dispensers. And so you not only have a sensor to, to alarm the initial spill, but if should the inner, the primary containment of that sump fail, you have another sensor that goes up that says there's fuel between the two walls before it gets to the outside. The, the likelihood of two walls failing at the same time is so remote that I, I don't know what the odds are, but they're certainly not remote. You have enough sensors that the sensor management, sensor maintenance become an issue here? Sensor failure given the numbers that you've got out there? DES comes around annually to make sure they all work for you. That's part of their job. There's the whole, there's the team that reviews my designs and, and comes out and does the construction inspection. There's another team that goes statewide and is making sure that these things all work. I think they're so that they are maintained. Review every three years and they uh, have staff sufficient to do it about every 2.8 years. But still. It may be so, but they're out making sure that the systems don't decay and go out of service and uh, just uh, window dressing. How long has this double wall pipe been in service? Um, I've been doing this work since 1994, and it was, it was around then. That was the beginnings of it, and the, the latest thing to come on board with double systems are the uh, sumps under the dispensers. And there was a deadline. Uh, December of 19, uh, 2015, rather, was a deadline for that. And basically, that was, basically, the EPA puts out the, the milestones of when the things had to happen. The states follow suit. That was New Hampshire's deadline of December 22 of 15, that the entire system has to be uh, duly contained. So, Very quickly, they were going to have to upgrade at that One point. more quick question. Uh, Dennis, if a sensor fails somewhere in this, uh, is an error code generated at the control board? I honestly don't know that. Okay. I don't install the meat. Anyone else? Yes, Corey. Corey Lane, Green Mountain Conservation Group. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like permission to read a, a letter I put together for to get it on public record. Let's take the letter. Oh, it's about it's about uh, procedure. It's about this hearing. I just would like to read Let's it. See it first. <laughs> it's public information, uh, it's, it's but sure, control. if you would like, uh, I would. You can read it. Excuse me, that's not up to you to make that decision. Do I have a second to Sam's motion to make it part of the record but not to be read? Make it part of the record but not to be read. Completely. With just a summarization. I think the board should have an opportunity to re read the letter before we make a decision. I agree with them. I'd like to look at the letter before I second a motion. Okay. Anybody else while well, we're waiting? Am I allowed to speak? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. 
Rich Fay again, longtime resident of OSPE. Um, also a Navy captain, engineer on a, on a ship. So very interested in all the contamination part. Also, uh, catastrophic response, um, point of contact for the Navy for both New Hampshire and Vermont a couple of years ago before I retired in 2015. So I know a little bit about what happens when you have an oil spill, especially in a river, not necessarily in an aquifer. We didn't, during the time that I was there, we didn't respond to that. But I was there during Irene when, um, in the command center in Concord, when Irene at six o'clock in the morning on Sunday diverted left and hit, hit um, Vermont instead of hitting the, uh, uh, the, you know, basically the OSPE area. My, my road was pretty much wiped out, but didn't hit it nearly as well, poorly as, uh, as Vermont. I'd like to make three comments in my observation as, as uh, somebody who's gone throughout this state in a government capacity. And it doesn't necessarily, we get down in the weeds on the technical parts of this. And we've got the engineers here, but we don't have anybody who's actually representing the LLC that's going to be doing this. So part of this is part of the LLC. No, won't. Are they here? One right there. There is their representative right there. And that man right there. Who? Mark is their representative. Okay, he's the representative for every. He's not just the engineer. He's not just the surveyor he or anything like that. Represents the LLC for everything. Owns this land. Okay, for everything. So can I, when they I are their agent. Okay. For this project. Okay. So, um, would you mind? I, this is the most convoluted place to speak. I don't know whether I can speak to the public or to the planning board. Who do you want me to speak to, sir? Speaking okay. to everybody. We can all hear you. It's all right. Okay, but I'd rather direct it to whoever, whoever it's, if you could come up here. Sure. So first of all, um, we're talking about, you know, you put a gas station pretty much anywhere on Route 16, it's good. But you put it on a contaminated site where you're going to activate, and this has been discussed, I've been to the previous meetings, I go on the video and watch the video, so I'm, I'm clear that all this, a lot of this has been discussed before. We get in the technicality and the, and the and basically, the, um, the integrity of the gas station. And by your explanation, it's pretty much it's tight. As far as your basic gas station, they meet the requirements as far as I see that they do. However, on this site in particular, it's a contaminated site that the public has said they don't want anything on there, especially a gas station. So that really concerns me. We get all bent out of shape about the gas station itself. It's disturbing the grand, ground underneath it that will probably open up some um, veins of contamination into the aquifer. Not, my, not just my concern, I think New Hampshire's got something on the order of a million dollars worth of bonds ready to, to, or worth of money still available to clean that up should that happen. So that's not just an idle concern. The second concern is uh, about 15 to 20 years ago, around Watson's, we wanted to do a roundabout. Ossipee was up in arms. Do Department of Transportation said, we're going to do this. Ossipee stopped it. Why? Because of traffic congestion. That was the biggest reasons for that. Uh, the other part was sort of, you'd have to move Watson's. I'm not sure if McDonald's was there beforehand or not. But that's a major concern. And I was here before there were traffic lights. So I know what it was like before we had major traffic. Since we don't let people from Tamworth or Madison or anybody else speak, um, I, I tell you what, I go up, on, up to Conway all the time and 41 is jam-packed. And on a Saturday, I don't care if you take a, a reading on, in January or May, it's nothing like July 4th get, trying to get people up to Conway on 16th. So until Department of Transportation comes out and says, we're good to go, it's not going to, like there's a 30% more constrict, con constriction or 10% more constriction, there is going to be more constriction, especially for people trying to exit 41. The final point, and then I don't have anything else to say, is, you know, you, we talked economically, and I remember the first meeting that we had, somebody came up and said, we need to step up, take a step back. Well, I took a step back. I don't belong to an aquifer association. I don't belong to a political party or anything like that. But I took a step back and looked at the economics of Route 16. And having been all over Vermont, unless you're in a dense urban area, or you're on the quarter in Route 1 near Boston, you 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 don't see any you don't there's there's no place where there's more gas stations along a 10 mile stretch than there is here. So by adding another gas station on this one little 10 mi 10 mile quarter with over 30 fuel tanks that are or fuel nozzles by adding an extra eight or 10 or however many it is, 
we're, we're going to, there's something that's going to happen. And everybody says, well, supply and demand doesn't really count for this. The more supply you get, the more tax revenue you're going to get, the more employment you're going to get. As most of you know, because I know most of you are residents here, we've bankrupted at least one um, gas station up there on the, up, up on the hill near um, Ace Hardware. We've, um, Watson's is small, so it's either going to have to get big or it's going to lose a lot of business. The Shell Oil Station is very small. That's going to either have to get big or it's going to constrict. And we have several um, gas stations to, such as Tedeschi's that comes in and out of business. It can barely survive that little gas station. Obviously, the Chicago <coughs> gas station has not survived for various reasons. A lot of it is just simply the placement of it. But it's not like we need the, the we're concerned that this is going to be a blight if somebody doesn't build something on this. This is not going to become a blight. If this gets put on there, something else is going to become a blight. The Shell Oil Station is going to become a blight. Watson's is going to become a blight. Some other place is going to become a blight. So if we're looking about the economic impact to Ossipi of putting another gas station on our Route 1 corridor, basically, another Boston um, go-through, I, I think we've got some, I've got, I think we've got to look at it again. And that's all I've got to say. We're not here to pick and choose who has the right to do a business or not right to do a business. It's our job to obey the laws. You're asking us to sit there, they can't do it because somebody else is already here. You can't do that. Business is business, and you got a right to do that. Being a Navy captain, you should know that. You took a note with all, the sir, it, 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 sir, sir, don't call me on that. With all I due respect, on that. with all due respect, the, the, uh, I, all I'm doing is responding to a point that was made back in April about the economic efficacy of having this gas station there. That, and that was, you didn't push back on that one. And I'm not, I, listen, I came in on the 18th just wanting to know what was going on. It doesn't, it doesn't personally concern me. I'm just responding on another side. You want to look at the benefits, here are the costs. If you check my eight and a half year record, you'll find out I've protected everybody's rights and then whether I like them or not. If they got a right to do something, I defend that right for them and I obey the state laws and the, and the town regulations. That's simple as that. If it puts somebody else, I'm sorry. There's my guy, I'm a logger. I got a lot of competition myself. I get hurt a lot by other businesses. That's just the way life is. They have a right to go or fail. That's simple as that. We don't pick winners or losers. I and buddy, I'm all. I absolutely agree with you. I'm not, that was not my argument. Okay. Sure sounded like. Okay. It's not. It's believe me. I'm. All right. Number one. These people have approached us. Put a gas station there. We have no right, by law, to tell them that they cannot put a gas station there unless we find safety, et cetera, et cetera. Number two, the ace next to the hardware store did not want to renew their tag. That's why they went out of business. That way I can read it too. Thanks. Crown came in. They're still a business. <laughs> I'm sorry, too. I didn't get that last part. Crown came in, and they're still a business. Here. Oh, but it was a blight for about ten years. Let's be honest. So it wasn't. So it wasn't where. Um, Mark and Vinnie had the gas station where the A side where is now. So, it's all a circle. Every one of these gas stations in town is on the aquifer. Period. But they're not on a contaminated site. They're, the contamination will be cleaned up. If there is. That is why there is a million dollars left for it. They have to have a geologist on site checking every bucket of dirt comes out of there. Yep. So. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Mike Veyu. I come from Madison. I, I saw information in the paper. I was concerned uh, as an area issue. Um, you chose not to make it an area issue. I respect your right to vote on and choose your feelings on issues. Um, what I am very concerned about is the right to speak at a public hearing. I do not know this young lady I chose to speak. She wrote a letter. I respect your right to put that as part of your record. I would like to hear, I have no idea what she's going to say. I'd like to hear her summarize 
what she said is her right to speak at a public hearing. This gentleman spoke many times today. I had no idea what he was going to talk about. Some of it was contentious with you. You guys listened to him. You can be contentious with her also, but I would I really think out of due respect we should be able to hear what she can summarize. We don't know what the letter was asked by the board to read it before they voted on it. That is what's happening. We have not denied her the right to read the letter or speak as of yet. Thank you. So, I mean, you got, you know, she put a two page letter in here. The board would like to read it. I know. Okay, now, double check. Joyce Watson, I just have a question, and I'm not really sure 100% what I'm talking about, um, but I thought there had been some changes voted by the Town of Ossipi pertaining to the aquifer. Do you know if there's an ordinance that has been passed? Yes. The original ordinance was passed in 1987. These people went to the ZBA which has the authority to override that vote. They chose to do that. Point of order, Mr. Chairman, 1989. The ordinance was first written in 87. And regardless of whether it was 87 or 89 or 90, the ZBA has the authority to overturn it. And they did. As a taxpayer in the town of Ossidy, is that something that I can have access to? To what now? A copy of the ordinance. Oh, it's in your zoning ordinance. It's on the Ossidy town website. Okay. The zoning ordinance. Part of the zoning ordinance. Bob. Ossidy.org. I have it. Thank you. Under the Water Protection Act, uh, you can't uh, look it up. Page 57. Page 57. Twenty point two point two A was what they were granted. Rick, you had a chance to read that. Yeah. Pass it back, please. Peter, you want to read this? I took a photo of it and I read it already. Thank you. All right. You want to I think Tim would like to read it, though he has not had an opportunity. I haven't read it completely. Apparently, it was supposed to run everything through uh, Green Mountain Conservation Group. Uh, they have their opinion, and well, I will entertain her opinion.
Sam, you made a motion. Yep. You know what your motion was? I made a motion that we make it part of the record because it needs to be read to be part of the minutes. I'll second that. Nobody else has. A motion is made and seconded. Discussion on it? Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I'd find maybe the facts aren't correct in this. Yeah. Uh, well, quite a few. So, you know, it's, it's another case of disinformation. And I think before you bring the paper before us like this, you should get the facts straight. I don't think it should be part of the record. No, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with, <coughs> with anybody coming in here and voicing an opinion. We need to hear that. That's correct. But you have to be correct in what you're saying. And this this application has not been accepted yet. It wasn't accepted on February 7th. Or we wouldn't be here right now. It's not accepted as complete? Yeah. Um, I we'd yeah, like to see it entered as part of the record along with every other letter that we've received uh, we're not here in a position to argue with the contents of these letters they are the opinion of members of the public uh, i would like to afford uh, corey uh, an opportunity to summarize her letter rather than reading it out i also agree that any uh, uh, public member should have a voice at the hearing, uh, but I would like to put a time limit on it, 90 seconds, two minutes, somewhere. Mr. Chairman, can I have a point of order? Yes, ma'am. Does the um, Town of Austin Plain where currently have rules of procedure that detail the limits on public speaking during comment period? No, it's right the discretion of the chairman. Based, based on the person speaking or the organization they represent? No. Okay. Thank you. No. Come on, Melissa. You know better than that. No, that's why I asked for a point of order. Thank you. All right. We have a motion and seconded to end a letter into the minutes and the public record. Public record, not yes, minutes. Five. Oh, me, All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries. Corey, you may stand up. I feel so special now. That's not true, Corey. That's you know, bad. I wrote that letter. Whoa! Because... You have presented a letter to this board. <laughs> More trash wise misrepresentation. And okay. you have quite a few. Mr. Chairman, I have an objection to the comments made by our alternates at the end of the room. The facts that you have presented, there are quite a few that are incorrect. That is your opinion. I did have. Someone fact check, and I understand I am not perfect. I may have made a mistake or two. Well, <coughs> it says the planning board originally accepted this application as complete on February 7th. Is that not what you did? No, we did not accept it until April 18th. Okay. It was conditionally. Matter of fact, we had to have the public hearing again. February 7th meeting <coughs> was withdrawn by the applicants. Okay. So, With all due respect, if you won't let me read the letter, I'd rather not argue about it secretly in front of the no, public I, who I, are interested I mean, in the concerns oh, I'm of the saying, Just public. like Dennis said, if you're going to present a letter, please get your facts straight. <laughs> we could name a few <coughs> problems with that statement, but um, I understand your position and not or preferring you, that I you don't may speak. summarize it. The summary is, and I believe a board member suggested this, that an attorney is consulted at the cost of the applicant to clear up some of these issues. Uh, having an independent site review, as you did with Westward Shores, would clear up a lot of the issues and the concern. This gas station has not been allowed in this area for 30 years for a reason. 
And because these variances were issued, we are now standing here today. It was two years ago in July they were issued. The file is incomplete. There is audio missing from one of the meetings. There's no deed. Uh, and there are other things that I was unable to get from Laura. That aside, this process <coughs> with the pr presentation on May 2nd is concerning because the public has a right to know. I looked at your agenda. It did not say White Mountain would be, or a Valley LLC would oh, be on the agenda. No, no. no I'm stop. It's a public hearing. Number one. I'm going to correct you. Number one, there is a deed from Edward Sullivan to Valley Point. I, when I have asked Laura for more information for that file, I have never, she said there is nothing else. She's spent time looking for information on it, and it's missing well, from the different sections. Well, we had it in our packet. You what? Two. Wait, you, excuse me? We, we have it in our packet. You have a D, you have a, the variance. No, we have the deed. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll come in and get that from Laura then. Number two. We did not accept it until April 18th. Okay, I apologize. It's hard to keep up. Number three. We have had an attorney, which we have corresponded with, and had 91A meetings about. So we know what is legal and what is not. 91A was sealed. I, so. I'm, I'm referring to um, Mr. Gillette's request for an attorney to review the development. And of Mr. Gillette impact. did not remember that he sent me a memo which I sent to the attorney. And the attorney replied, and Mr. Gillette got his answer in a 91A meeting. So that has been settled. The public number doesn't two, understand that, though. Number two, May 2nd was an open meeting, public meeting. No one came. It was not on the agenda. It was on the agenda. It was not on the agenda, and I would say it is still not on the agenda today on your website. Is now it? you're talking website versus our agenda. So do I have to come to every meeting to see what's on the agenda, or can I trust that when Laura posts May the May 2nd, 2nd if can, agenda? If you care to see this, it's right there. I'll show you the ones that you leave on the website. And we don't put it. Could I ask if she be allowed to simply to summarize her letter so we can let move on with our business? Rather than arguing with it? Was given that. Well, yeah, but then people interrupt and argue with her rather than just letting her make a statement. This is what's available to the public. That is what what's I printed that? out today. What's that? What's that? Case to May 16th. Continued public hearing. Well, that isn't what on, is on my agenda. <laughs> How is the public supposed to keep up with this? And when people are concerned, and there is a lot of its, a lot of because space. we meet twice a month, and if they're really interested in it, they become it every time until the case was settled. I am not going to allow this kind of generation to us. We hold a public hearing every the first Tuesday of every month and the third Tuesday. You hold a planning board meeting. This is it is a public the meeting, which may anything may come in front of this board. So for the record, the public has to attend every planning board meeting to understand what's going on. We cannot but rely on the agenda posted on your website. What we discussed, May 2nd, Mark went over, all over again tonight, because the public 
was not here on the second. So. Is there a mismatch between what the, the agenda was published on the website and what we actually wrote? I don't know. Yes. If you're yeah, saying that White Mountain was on your agenda, it is still, if you look at Ospie's website, I believe today I saw it right there. Uh, it's probably still up there that way. And it's hard as a citizen to follow this around when, you know, you see it on the agenda, you hear it out of the board, and then you present on a day when nobody is here. You were here April 18th. Right. So, the public was informed April 18th. And you can read the minutes of I April 18th. Uh, of April 18th that said we would be discussing it May 2nd and the hearing would resume on the 16th. That is in the minutes. You were here. You were Gavin. So you didn't hear it. Yes, Joyce. I'm sorry, and I'm not here to make conflict because it, personally it doesn't matter whether it goes through or it doesn't go through. But I was at this April 18th meeting, and at the end of the meeting, my understanding, and maybe I didn't understand, but Sam made a motion to stop the public comment. Then what I understood after that was there was going to be a meeting on May 2nd with no public comment except from no. White Mountain Survey. No. That is not. And I made that point to Mark, right, <coughs> that every one of our meetings is an open meeting. It's to the public. The public may speak. Am I correct, Mark? Yep. You are correct, and I chose to be here. So, and if Mark wasn't here, we could not have discussed it. But, uh, but I, the point that I was trying to make was, I understood at the April meeting on May 2nd that the public was not going to be allowed to discuss this anymore. That was never, no. We never said that. Well, we I never said was, that. We never said that, Dennis. Uh, there was a lot of confusion mm -hmm. because one motion was made and it was corrected, I believe, by you, wasn't it? You said there was a point of order or something and then we discussed it a little further. Uh, we talked about it for a few minutes and then we said that we can't close it and we would discuss it on May 15th. So that's what... Hey, now, I'm not going to say that you couldn't have been confused by it because I think everybody was a little confused up until the very end when they said that they couldn't close the meeting. They continued it to May 15th. Yes, Corey. You want to say some more? You can summarize your letter. The summary is due process for the, for the people. Uh, and I feel that some things are being missed. I'm not saying it's intentional, but I'm saying it's important to be sure everybody receives due process. That's what the letter's about. A lot of that is regional impact when you have Tamworth abutters. Are they within 200 feet of this proposal? Are Tamworth abutters notified within 200 feet of this gas station? Yeah. There was no Tamworth to be notified. No abutters live in Tamworth? 212 feet. Okay. They're very, very close, though. It's hard to tell with the mailing addresses, but, but um, our concern is due process, that you follow due process, give everybody, you know, the same rights to speak, as it be Tamworth, Freedom, Madison, other towns address the DRI you know, as they receive the application. At this point, we've gone a long, a long way without input from other towns. Like I said, I... Well, I disagree with that. A lot of towns have been talking. Mr. Burns relied on Green Mountain to notify your regional no, impact of butters. That, to me, is not due process. When I'm trying to keep we up with your agenda, and you have a different anybody. one than the public has on your website. We have not granted any budget to ask to anybody. 
I realize that, and okay. that's the problem. But we don't have to notify Why? Why is it a problem? Because of the law. Because of no. the RSA. No. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> way off, way off yeah. base on that. Uh, you go way off, Corey. Uh, Encouraged. May. Because of the it's developments of regional May. impact. No, May. Sure. May. We don't have to. Doesn't stay oh, shell. May. Oh, okay. No, no. The word is encouraged. So, you may. Okay, so you decided on your own not to notify. And I don't want to take up any more of your time because, you know, no. I, I know no. how this is. And a law, have, have consult from an attorney, Green Mountain suggests, and have an independent site review so people can, as Mr. Lucy uses the phrase, sleep at night. Uh, people are living much closer to this proposal than I think anyone in this room would want to do. So give it the chance of a independent site plan review, paid for by the applicant, not the town of Ossipee. No, we're not going to put the app into that either. Number one, Corey, you've been at every meeting except for the May 2nd meeting. You voiced your opinion. We have asked the applicant to do more than what DES has required them to do. They have gone above and beyond what is required. We have given every person who ever came into this room the opportunity to speak. We have never denied anyone the right to speak from the public or from this boy. Actually, it seems to me she was the one that's trying to get us to use France laws. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for taking my comment. Donna Bayou from Madison. Um, I, I, I'm just trying to understand uh, a project with this impact I would love to hear the rationale why the board decided not to invite Tamworth and Madison to the discussion. I, under the good neighbor concept, I would think that would be not an exceptional thing to do, but a reasonable thing to do. And I would really, really Without contention, I, I just was wondering your thought process. Can I answer that? In no, my opinion. Whoa, whoa. Yes. You weren't giving a better status, okay? But you're more than welcome to come in and voice your opinion on anything that happens. Here. Oh, I understand. There's a big difference between the two. No, I, okay. and I understand that. All it's your from concerns. The okay, municipal sorry. side of it. Why did you not give? Tamworth officials, Madison's officials, Freedom's official, to come to speak to you. Tamworth sent one official here. The selectman came. Okay. He voiced his opinion of what they just weren't given about the status, and is it? And you know. And why not? Why, why not? Well, Two hundred feet away, a half a mile away. Madison is just like a hop, skip, and a jump from from the uh, the site. Because this is the town of Ossipee. Okay? Good We're neighbor. not going to do anything that's going to hurt Freedom or Madison. That's all. Yeah. We're all in this together. That's true. Yeah. But I'm elected by the people of Osprey, not Madison, not Freedom. Okay? I'm looking out for their best interest. At the same time, trying to do things right by everybody else. We invite people to come in and give us their opinion. We want to hear what they are. But, you know, the meeting with the ZBA last week, uh, there was no, nothing new that came out of that that we haven't already asked and dealt with on the Western Shores thing, okay? And the same thing tonight. I haven't heard anything here from the group that adds to anything that we haven't all worried about or asked questions about or asked them to do. We have to go by the law. They have, they have to meet certain criteria in order for this plan to go through, okay? They have to meet septic and water and... Look, that's not in our hands. That's the state requirements. 
we look out for the zoning, and they got they got a variance in order to do that up there. So we treat everybody that comes through that door the same way. My feelings might be the same as yours. Would I like to see something else there? Probably would. But that okay? still doesn't answer my question out of two respect. Why didn't you give them a butter status? Can I answer? Because you did answer, answer that question. You answered several times. Several times. Well, I Roy. Don't get mad. I did. I voted against it because of the Westwood Shores about his status. Their attitude was, uh, "We're not telling you how to run your town, but you know we don't do what you want. They're going to sue us." And they did. They're trying to run the town by proxy, and I, I'm a little yes. sick of it. I don't mind you coming in, and stating your opinion. We'll work with you the best we can. But if they meet the requirements, they they're doing what's required in the law. They've gone the extra mile. We have no right to disapprove it. I don't like other towns telling us what to do. I don't mind you coming in and giving an opinion. So why, why is there RSA? It says we may. We right. don't have to. Point of order, right. Mr. Chairman. And we did not. Right. The, the last sentence in that RSA reads, and I quote, doubt concerning regional impact shall be resolved in a determination that the development has potential regional impact. In other words, there was doubt on this board, and yet the board voted not to grant regional there impact, even though it's determined in the RSA as a... Uh, no vote. vote. There was a vote by this board not to give regional impact. It was not doubtful in the minds of the people that voted not to give it. There was my, your mind and Bob's mind, and that was it. There's no qualification as to who's doubt. It just says doubt, sir. That is why you have a vote. <laughs> I just wanted that to be part of the records. Well, you're taking one sentence out of the rest of the whole law out of the content. I am not. I read. It's short. Yes. Okay. The yeah, RSA that you're referring to. The purpose, it gives three purposes for what the definition is there for. Mm -hmm. Okay? The last one, it says encourage the municipality having jurisdiction to consider the interest of others potentially affected by, by that municipality. It says encourage. So everything you read after that, okay, if you don't agree with it, if you're not encouraged by it, you don't have to follow it. That's the it's point of it. An interesting interpretation. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. Yes. Uh, we were not given a lot of status as when freedom built up there, like Osby Shoreline, condominiums, etc. Madison, I can never remember anything that they've done. Jamworth, they more or less gave them anybody that wants to come in and do something, <laughs> do it. Because there's no zoning and there's no water protection. <coughs> so we are not being given the same status from these other towns. We have the right to ask for it at any time, of course, and I don't know that we have ever asked for it as other towns have been asking here. There is one <coughs> effect of not granting regional status that should be pointed out, and that is the Lakes Region Planning Commission would automatically, if it had regional impact, uh, be able to voice its views and its thoughts on the process. So we don't have their input. All right, Bob. We've gone over this five times. It's getting too old. I don't want to cut you off, but that's... Well, I think the vote's been done. The, day, so. the vote has been done. <coughs> the vote has been done. For regional impact and for Tamworth, who was the only one that wanted the butter status. So we're going to move on. Someone else has something they'd like to say? I hear nothing. I will close the public input. Are we 
satisfied as a board? <coughs> the application being complete, which we be voted on. Mr. Chairman, I have one question for you. Or a statement. The application has been complete. And you're saying, Mark, that this is the final plan? Yes, with, with the addition of the approvals once they are um, have been granted from outside agencies. So, yes. In order to serve the best interest of the town, I request that we continue this until our next meeting to give the board appropriate time to review the revised drawings because there are been substantial changes made to the drawings and the plans. The and drawing, the drawing. we have not had an opportunity to look at them. They were not given to us ahead of time. The drawings were, have not been updated since April 18th. Is that correct, Mark? Other than the page. Other, I remember I, correctly, you said that you revised them as of April 18th, not from them. We have gotten input from this board as well as the fire department and outside agencies but that, have was, that was resulted right. in changes since I met with you uh, April 18th. So the last, the, what's the date of these plans? Uh, yesterday, May 15th. Okay. I don't have, I don't have a problem with these plans. They've just enhanced what they would do. That's correct. I don't, yeah, have, I don't have a problem. I would like to see, before this is complete, uh, we discussed it earlier, I, I strongly feel there needs to be some kind of alarm in that paint, say three quarters or whatever, to alert someone who's filling those things. I just, I know it can happen, I've seen it happen, and, it, and this is a very simple thing to put in. We did it in both places that work in, and I really think you need to to see that part of the, part of the uh, Okay, Dennis, um, the fill alarms, uh, I would say that they chime at 90%. And Where are we set them? Yeah. Okay, so it can be set at 85%? I would, I would suggest 90. You don't want the thing going off. Oh, pretty sure. okay, that's 2%. Before it starts to slow down, the, the driver still has the additional 3% of quantity to, to drain his hoses and so on. Perhaps we can put it in a different context. What's the time? Let's say the truck is full, so it's not going to It's a matter of minutes I or seconds. I don't know. We can set it at any time. I mean, it's just, it's, I just think it's something that has to be considered. It'll allow me to shut out there. You're talking about a 30,000 gallon tank. 10,000. 10,000. 10,000. So it's 90%, you've got 900, 900 gallons. 9,000 gallons. 9,000. 9,000 gallons. 9,000, excuse me. Yeah. So you've got a gallon, 1,000 gallons. 1,000 gallons. Actually, it's only loaded at 95, mm -hmm. so you only have 500 to go. Right. So if the alarm went off at 90. You have 500 left to go. Yeah. No, he's got 1,000. <coughs> 500 left, yeah. So if you set it back yeah, down to 80, total. 85 or something is a thousand gallons. Pick a number. It's that simple. 85 right. percent? We will. I'm, I'm fine with any kind of system that you set up so that driver knows what he's back. That will be one of the three drivers. We'll get to it. Excellent. All right, well, Thank you. I'm just looking for guidance. Yeah. Thank you. But I mean, well, you decide. it'll be in. The approval motion. Mr. Okay. Chairman, I have one more question for Mark. Yeah. Just a quick one. Or, or your consultant. Um, generally speaking, what's the capacity of the truck that's delivering fuel on a daily delivery? Tank, it could be 12,000 gallons, but okay. many of them are compartmentalized. Yeah. So, so they, so they vary. It could be 4,000 per compartment for okay. different uh, grades. Okay. Thank you. Good question. To, to answer back to the uh, the time thing, when you get to the 90, 
92%, certainly the flow slows down, so time gets longer as, as it's filling. So if you reach that point, that's the intention of that. I move that we take the time in the town's best interest to continue this to our next meeting so we all have an opportunity to yes, thoroughly yeah. review all of our changes that we are seeing on the drawings and in the documents just handed to us because there's new information here. And I think it would behoove us to serve the town's best interest to do that at this point. Number one, if you were going to continue it, you have to continue it to a certain date. Our next meeting? This is not a date. Our next meeting is when? <coughs> June 6th. June 6th, I'm sorry. Motion has been made. We have a second. <coughs> I'll second that. Then this is second. Any discussion? I think it's a good idea. A little more time isn't going to hurt anybody. And they'll be able to put any final changes. I talked about here under the under the board. I have a question, right. if possible. Yes. I know we're in a discussion period, but I just have a question for Mark. Um, I think I know the answer, but I'm just going to ask it. Sure. Even after we pass, let's say that we go to the next meeting and this is approved and we pass it, it is very possible these plans will get in change because of state requirements after you leave here. That is correct. Thank you. That's why you will only get. <coughs> conditional approval. Mm -hmm. That's why we use conditional mm -hmm. approval on a project like this. Mm -hmm. So that Good point. if he has to make changes by state and they can't get the permit without the changes, they have to come in with new plans. We can approve those new plans. We don't have to have a public hearing. But we can approve it because it's, it's considered uh, housekeeping. <laughs> Any other discussion? Anybody from the public want to say anything? Good idea. I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Favor. One, two, three, four. Opposed. Opposed. Two opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, folks. I guess. Mark. Thank you, Mark. See you June sixth. Sorry. No, don't be. I don't I don't know. Know. You get paid for being there, right? <laughs> yes.
what what the permit application, which has gone. And this former train depot plans by Rhymes Petroleum. Which depot is that? Sure, that's home. But the tracks won't be affected so that those little train cars can continue to run up and down. Well, the train doesn't move over the tracks, do not go over there now. That's beyond the brake. Right. So, yeah, they have to repair the culvert and lay new track. Yeah, the little cars go, they go across the road, don't they? Where, where are we talking now? Down in Oscar. Hey, the old uh, formation department the train across the road. State road. Down there. Track oh, stop oh, 28. The track stop at the bridge. Right. That's as far as the trains go. They actually back up them. No, they can't. The culvert's never been repaired. There's a culvert, a beaver culvert. I know because I walked down. <laughs> I biked there. You're right. <laughs> There's a beaver. They took the culvert off. And well, I do believe the money's been appropriated for to repair the tracks. I do believe I heard that the two. Osby Agates Railroad and the other people have gotten together and come up with a contract for the use of it. That section is what I heard. Oh. Uh, your Osby Agates train? Yeah. They're very protective of the tracks. Well, they are. I understand that. What I'm saying is I understand they came to an agreement last year about the <coughs> track. I do believe they don't, heard. they don't. Right now, they don't go beyond that call. But which they can put a hundred car train to that car. Well, I'm, what I'm trying to say is uh, I understand they hope they open up uh, freight Conway sometime in a couple of years. I know, I don't it very much, but yeah. money's been appropriate. But the club tells me. Well, so at this point, Mr. Chairman, this is just hearsay as far as we know? No, it's not hearsay. Okay. It's just a letter that came in from the inquiry, and we have spoken to the manager ah. of Rhymes, yeah. the local manager, and he has told us that at the present time they're only going to use it for storage. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And everybody's let the rat out. Two letters that are in oh, one letter. About guts and gas. Which, which was in your uh, back. I didn't get a pack. Oh, this one here. Last thing. Anyone else? Yes, Corey. I didn't say anything. Apparently, I have, to, I have to sit here to know what's going on, so I thought I'd wait it out. Oh, no. Jesus Christ. It's always room for surprise. I Any thought that's what Shores was on your agenda as well. Any other business to come before? Nope. Motion we adjourn. Second. The second discussion. You're a victim. <laughs> You're lucky. Too late. The vote's been done. I know. You're lucky. <laughs>